Hello and thank you for joining us. We got a jam-packed show for you today. This week, Mitch McConnell continued to block stimulus relief. Vaccination goals were not met. A Chinese journalist was jailed. Argentina legalized abortion and more. I'm Ian Stevens and you're watching the Lucretia Report Week in Review. Let's get into it. Our lead story this week is, of course, the continuing saga of COVID-19 relief, which went through a roller coaster this week before, at least for now, landing right back where it started. After Congress passed a $900 billion bipartisan stimulus bill that included a one-time $600 direct payment to individuals, Donald Trump indicated that he may not sign the bill, saying that $600 was not enough and that it should be increased to $2,000. Democrats and some Republicans quickly accepted this. But the fact that Trump waited until after the bill was passed complicated matters. Congress attempted to seek unanimous consent to move to a vote to amend the bill, but this was blocked by Republican leaders Kevin McCarthy in the House and Mitch McConnell in the Senate. After Republican leadership shot the idea down, Donald Trump acquiesced and signed the bill, but Senator Bernie Sanders is still pushing for $2,000 direct payments. Donald Trump recently vetoed the NDAA, the bill set to fund the U.S. military through 2021, and Bernie Sanders is filibustering the override of this veto that the Senate is attempting to do, saying that he will continue to filibuster the override until the Senate votes on $2,000 direct payments. Meanwhile, Mitch McConnell is trying to bundle $2,000 direct payments together with a commission to investigate fictitious allegations of voter fraud and a repeal of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act in a poison pill maneuver that he knows will make passage virtually impossible. A large bomb went off in Nashville, Tennessee on Christmas morning. Authorities are so far declining to call this domestic terrorism because he's white, or I mean because they don't know his motives yet. In a strange attack, the bomb went off at 6.30 in the morning on Christmas, next to a building that wouldn't have had very many people in it even on a normal day, and broadcast a message with a countdown warning that it was going to explode, as if the bomber didn't want to kill anyone. And other than himself, he didn't kill anyone, although eight people were injured. Authorities believe that the bomber who died in the blast was 63-year-old Anthony Quinn Warner and that he acted alone. The bomb went off next to an AT&T building, and it's believed that Warner was acting on paranoid 5G conspiracy theories that have been floating around the internet. Donald Trump has issued a number of pardons, including for Charles Kushner, the father of Jared Kushner, for his associates Michael Flynn, Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, Alex Van Der Zwan, and George Papadopoulos, for former Republican congressmen Duncan Hunter, Chris Collins, and Steve Stockman, and for three war criminals who were convicted of murder while working for the military contractor Blackwater. Crazy how every single one of them is a white male, huh? Must be a coincidence. Donald Trump has been widely criticized for making a mockery of justice with these pardons and for placing his own associates above the law, and while it's not uncommon for presidents to issue controversial pardons in their final days, Donald Trump has been doing so at a much faster rate. Many also believe that these are not the last, with pardons for the likes of Rudy Giuliani and Ivanka Trump coming in the near future possibly. President-elect Joe Biden has criticized the Trump administration for continuing to stifle his transition. Although the Government Accountability Office has approved of the transition, he says that senior political appointees in the Pentagon and the Office of Management and Budget have been putting up roadblocks. The White House denies this, saying that he has exaggerated the problem, but Trump officials have admitted on the record that they don't want to help the Biden transition in any way that would make it easier for him to reverse Trump policies more quickly. As we report every week, COVID-19 cases and deaths have reached new records, as many hospitals are at or above capacity and many states and municipalities are out of ICU beds. More than one in every 1,000 Americans has now died of COVID-19, and despite having only 5% of the world's population, the United States now has 20% of the world's COVID-19 deaths and 25% of the world's COVID-19 cases. Meanwhile, the first U.S. cases of the new, more contagious strain of COVID-19 that was discovered in Great Britain have been discovered in Colorado. Vaccinations have begun to roll out all around the country. 
But despite the Trump administration's promise that 20 million people would be vaccinated before the end of the year, which is in seven hours, Happy New Year, barely over 2 million people have been vaccinated so far, and 20 million cases haven't even been distributed. President-elect Joe Biden has criticized the Trump administration for this slow rollout and has set a goal of 1 million doses per day during his administration. Comedian and political commentator Jimmy Dore is pushing progressive members of the House towards what he calls force to vote. The idea relies on, first of all, that there will be much slimmer margins for Democrats during the 117th Congress, and second of all, that there are actually a lot more progressive members of the House than just the squad. There's the incoming Cory Bush, Jamal Bowman, and Marie Newman. There's the relatively new Katie Porter, Ro Khanna, and Pramila Jayapal. The more veteran Barbara Lee, Raul Grijalva, Mark Pocan, and more. In fact, there are 94 members of the House Progressive Caucus. So the idea is that Nancy Pelosi, unlike last time, will need every Democratic vote to reaffirm her speakership. So for progressives to make a deal with Nancy Pelosi, that they will reaffirm her speakership if, in exchange, she will bring Medicare for All to the floor for a vote. Adam Coy, the Columbus, Ohio police officer who recently killed Andre Hill, has been fired. Coy was responding to a non-emergency call about someone repeatedly turning a car on and off in the middle of the night when he shot and killed Hill. Hill was unarmed and not accused of a crime, and in violation of department policy, Coy had turned off his body cam before the incident and only turned it back on after he had already killed Hill. In other headlines, Zhang Zhan, the Chinese journalist who first reported on the coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan, has been arrested and charged with picking quarrels and provoking trouble, a charge which the Chinese government uses to prosecute dissidents. And Chinese billionaire and founder and CEO of Yuzu Games, Lin Qi, has died. A colleague of his is in custody who Chinese police suspect of poisoning him. Argentina has become the first major country in Latin America to legalize abortion. The United Kingdom has approved AstraZeneca's troubled COVID-19 vaccine for emergency use. And Republican Congressman-elect 41-year-old Luke Letlau of Louisiana has died of COVID-19. That's the news of the week. Thank you for joining us for it. To get the news every Thursday, subscribe and turn on the notification bell. And to get this and more in print form every Friday, sign up for our newsletter at lucreciareport.com slash email hyphen list. And to support independent progressive media, go to patreon.com slash lucreciareport. Thank you for joining us, and I'll see you on Saturday.